How can you increase your retirement income? That's what we're going to talk about today on the Your Financial EKG live stream, increasing your retirement income. And I want to go through three specific strategies to help you increase your retirement income, as well as specific retirement income strategies throughout this live stream. So I want to go through personal or personal retirement strategies so you can see how implementing these retirement income strategies can actually help increase your retirement income. I feel like I've said retirement income about a thousand times in the first two minutes. But hey, thank you so much for joining. Let's get right into it. How can we maximize our retirement income? How can we increase our retirement income? Well, the first way that you can increase your retirement income is really simple, and that is maximizing your retirement accounts. Maximize your 401k, maximize your IRA, maximize your 403b and your Roth IRA. Take advantage of contribution limits. Take advantage of catch-up contributions. Use your retirement accounts to your benefit. Let me show you for 2023, these are the new contribution limits. So the amount individuals can contribute to their 401k plans in 2023 will increase to 22,500 up 2,000 or $2,000 from 20,500 in 2022. The income ranges for, for determining eligibility to make deductible contributions, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, and claim the savers credit will all increase for 2023. So if we're trying to increase our retirement income, we need to maximize our 401ks, our IRAs, our 403bs, our TSPs, our Roth IRAs, and make sure you have increased your contributions if you can. So the contribution limit for employees who participate in 401ks, 403bs, most 457 plans and TSPs increased to 22500 For IRAs, it increased to 6500 And the IRA contribution limit or catch-up limit for over 50 individuals is now at $1,000. So you can put $7,500 a year into your IRA and your Roth IRA. So growing your 401ks, growing your IRAs, growing your Roth IRAs is a great way to increase your retirement income. Because look, look, think about it this way. More retirement savings, more retirement income. Because what we want to look at trying to do is not taking a large percentage of our asset for retirement income for a, as a withdrawal percentage. We want to look at taking somewhere between 2 and 4% off of our retirement assets for retirement income. Now, that's going to be in combination with Social Security, pensions, any kind of other income that you've got in, maybe rental income that's coming in. So we want to try to keep the withdrawal percentage on our retirement assets somewhere between 2 and 4%. Let me give you a good example. If you've got $500,000 saved for retirement and you need to you need $20,000 a year in retirement income, let's look at the, what's that first let me go to my calculator so I don't tell you wrong here. Math on live TV. That's 4%. So that's perfect. You're right in line with that 4% rule. But if you need $50,000 a year over and above social security or pensions, maybe you're not at social security age, and you're taking out 10% or 8% from your retirement investments, that's just going to bring it as a depreciating asset. So if we can contribute more to our 401ks, contribute more to our IRAs, our Roth IRAs, that is going to increase our 401, I mean, that's going to increase our 401k balances as well as increasing our retirement income. And we really need to be aware of that. I read a study, actually, I think I read this last week. Let me see if I can find the article real quick here. This is out of the Wall Street Journal. And this is really interesting because what it shows us, let me get it here. And this might not be the Wall Street. Yeah, it is the Wall Street Journal. Okay, Wall Street Journal. 
So as slave as savings slowly shrink, consumer spending is on borrowed time. And basically what this article talked about is that, you know, we had a lot of savings built up from the pandemic, whether that was in stimulus payments, whether that was in extra income, whether that was in our expenses were lower because we were staying home. And so consumers built up unprecedented savings during the COVID-19 pandemic, thanks to government stimulus and fewer opportunities to spend. What we're seeing now is we're seeing this, here's this excess spending or excess savings, and now it's coming down rapidly. And so what I don't want to see as a financial advisor is us get back to the norm. Pre-COVID, people were not saving as much in their IRAs and in their 401ks. Post-COVID, we've actually seen individuals take it more seriously saving. We've seen, I've seen retirement uh, people retiring early because they want to do it. They're making the sacrifice needed to retire early, retire at 55. And so they've been saving more. But what this chart shows us is many Americans and many individuals are actually spending their savings. And so what I'm telling you is I'm not telling you I don't want you to enjoy life. I'm not saying I don't want you to live. But what I do want you to do is to continue contributing to your 401ks, to your IRAs. And if you have the ability to increase those contributions, do that. Increase your contributions. We also have gotten a look at some of the, let me see if I can find the Charles Schwab article here that was really good. This actually shows kind of a concerning analysis. Here it is. Inflation already slicing into retirement savings. This is from Investment News, but it's a Schwab survey. And what the Schwab survey found was that 401k participants, 79% of workers are changing their saving and spending habits because of inflation, while 44% have altered their 401k investments. So they're cutting, uh, workers are cutting the number of purchases they make, buying cheaper products, paying off debt more slowly, but they're also not contributing or they're reducing their contribution to their 401ks or they're stopping the contribution completely to their 401ks. And you do not want to be doing that. You want to continue to contribute to your 401, can continue to contribute to your IRA. Listen, if life happens, things happen in life. I've had roof, I had a roof leak from Hurricane Nicole recently. And so you look at that and you say, okay, that money's got to go out to pay for that roof leak. And if that causes you a situation where you have to decrease the amount of money you're putting into your 401k or in your IRA, that's okay. But continue to contribute. Continue to stay on the path for saving for retirement. Don't let emotions and don't let the news media or what you read on Facebook, things like that, don't let that kind of stuff alter you contributing to your account, contributing to your 401ks, contributing to your overall retirement income. Because the best way for you to increase your retirement income, the best way is to increase the amount of savings that you have before you retire. Because there's no pixie dust that's going to increase your retirement savings if you are decreasing the amount that you have in there at a fast rate. So let's look at this. And the reason I, I talk about it as well, and, I, and I've shown this visual a lot on, the, on live streams. And the reason I do it is not necessarily like I don't want you to feel bad about where you're at saving wise for retirement. Nor do I want you to like pound your chest and say, look at me, I'm doing fantastic. I just want this to be something you look at and you say, okay, I'm inspired by these numbers or I'm convicted by these numbers and I'm going to continue to do what is necessary to retire. I'm going to do the necessary things to retire. And the reason we want to continue to maximize our retirement accounts to continue increasing our retirement income is because if you look at the averages, if you look at the averages that are out there, individuals are not saving enough for retirement. So this is based on a Vanguard study. This is based on age. And this is how much they have in retirement accounts based on age and based on their Vanguard account balances. Now, keep in mind, someone might have one, two, three or four accounts at Vanguard. So they might be counted three or four times. But if you look at just U.S. Census Bureau, the Fed's, you know, how the Fed takes data, if you look at all the data out there from Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Census Bureau, we are not saving enough for retirement. We really have a retirement savings conundrum in this country because we're, we're not doing it. We have, we have this YOLO lifestyle, especially my generation, don't get me wrong, but 
we are going to eventually become 60. So if you look at this, between ages 45 and 54, this is the average and this is the median. We like the median. That's a lot closer to what it actually is than the average because the average gets thrown off because like you got Bill Gates's IRA up here and then you got, you know, a 20 year old's IRA here. It just started saving. So they're at zero and Bill Gates is at like whatever he's at. And so that throws off the averages where the median goes right to the middle boop, and puts a little dot. So the median 45 to 54 save for retirement, 61,530, 55 to 64, 89,716. Now, if they've got two or three accounts, where are we at? 60, let's say that's times two, that's 120,000. That's still not enough to retire. So don't take these numbers as something where I'm beating you over the head and saying, you're doing a bad job. You're doing terrible. You're never going to be able to retire. No, you can retire with less in retirement savings than a lot of, I would say, professionals or people who think that they write articles for four. You know, I've done a lot of videos on this channel. Can I retire at 55 or can I retire at 60? And it's not $2 million or $3 million. Sometimes it's can I retire at 62 with $500,000? And I, I just worked on a video that we just got edited. It's going to come out in the next couple of weeks. It's can I retire at 62 with $500,000? And it was this lady who called me and that's what she had. And we worked through a plan that she could retire on less than what the experts say that you need to have saved for retirement. So I'm not telling you this because you can't retire. Retirement's all about cash flow. In her case, it's about cash flow. The where's our cash flow going to come from? Social Security, pensions, things like that. But we need to continue to maximize our retirement accounts because that's going to increase our retirement income. So number one, the first way that you can increase your retirement income is to maximize your retirement accounts. The second way that you can increase your retirement income is to understand Social Security, to maximize Social Security for your specific situation, for you as a individual or as a family. And I always love talking about Social Security because if you watch YouTube videos or if you read Forbes or if you read the Wall Street Journal, they're all going to say the same thing. Take Social Security at 70. Take it at 67. Take, you know, you need to do this, this and this. And they just blanket statement it because they're just blanket. And I've done that, you know, when I'm giving advice on a, on a video, sometimes I have to give a blanket statement. But that doesn't mean it affects, it's, it's for everybody. So Social Security optimization, understanding when you're going to claim Social Security. When your spouse is going to claim Social Security, when your partner is going to claim Social Security, maybe you're single. You know, I got a lot of single clients and we're doing retirement planning for singles or retirement planning for a single person. And they come to me and they go, I, I just had this as a single individual. And they said, hey, Drew, I'm going to take Social Security at 62. He retired at 61. He lives in New York. He said, I'm going to take Social Security at 62 because it's my money and I want to get to it. And I said to him, I said, does that make sense? For, I mean, it, is that, are you taking it just because you're worried Social Security is going to go defunct and you're not going to get your money? Or are you taking it because you need it? And when we got going through the plan, when we started to really analyze what his spending was, his investments and his expenses, it made more sense for him to take Social Security at 67 or even 70 because he was a single guy. And all of his investments, all of his retirement income is on me, myself, and I. So in the sense of investing, we need to make sure that our social security is optimized. Did Drew forget about us or is he having a problem getting this going? Am I not live? Am I live right now? I think I'm live. I hope I'm live. <laughs> if I'm not live, somebody tell me in the comments that I am not live. Let me check my, let me check the live stream real quick here. Let's go. All right. It looks like I'm live. Let's see here. All right. I'm live. I'm live. Don't scare me like that. Don't scare me like that. Cause we're talking about increasing our retirement income. And I don't want to cause, <laughs> I don't want anybody to think we are not live. So delaying social security. So I want to get into some retirement planning software here. And I want to show you why it's important to understand when exactly you are going to claim social security. And let me show you, this is our financial software that we use. So when we're doing a financial EKG for someone, this is exactly what we are doing. 
Um, let's see. This is for Chris and Jasmine Alfred. And the reason I like this scenario is because Chris is much older than Jasmine. So he's 68 and she's 49. And so Social Security is really important because of one of two reasons. The first reason is the age difference. We've got about a 19 year age gap in their, you know, Chris is probably going to pass away first, right? Barring something tragic happening to Jasmine. Something's, Chris will probably pass away first. So we got to make sure we select Social Security at the most optimal time. And the second reason why we want to make sure we take Social Security at the most optimal time is because when Chris does pass away, when he passes away, Jasmine's going to get his Social Security. And so we want to make sure he's taking it at the appropriate time so that she'll get the most amount of money because odds are she's going to be single, right, in the at the end of her retirement, right? I mean, because he's 68. Let's say he lives to 85. That's 15 years. That puts her at 65. So from 65 on, she's probably going to be single, and we want to make sure Social Security is maximized for her. So let's look at this. So Chris at 70 is what we're showing, taking Social Security. His Social Security benefit at 70 would be $4,135. Now, Chris is unique. He's still working. Okay, he likes to work, and that's what he wants to do. And he's going to retire at 70. Okay, Jasmine works part time. Uh, she raises the kids or raised the kids. So she works part time now. The kids are gone. Um, and what we're looking at, because she raised the kids, her Social Security benefits much less. So what we want to do is when she gets to 67, okay, so that's 17 years from now, if Chris is still living, okay, so he would be 90. If Chris is still living, then we want to take a spousal benefit because that is going to be the most optimal Social Security strategy for Jasmine. What is a spousal Social Security benefit? So a spousal Social Security benefit is if you have two married people and one person's Social Security is higher than the others by more than half. So a good example would be um, if his Social Security is $3,000 and the spouse's is only going to be $1,000, half of $3,000 would be $1,500. So that's a spousal benefit. Now you can take a spousal benefit at 62 but you get a reduced benefit. I think it's about 32% of the half benefit, okay? At 67, if Jasmine claims a spousal benefit at 67, she would get half of Chris's 67 Social Security, his full retirement Social Security. Not his 70 Social Security, his full retirement age Social Security. So if you look here, you see he's going to take Social Security at 4135 at 70 Half of that is 2067. That's not what she gets. She gets half of his age 67 Social Security, which is $1,667. Okay. Now, a widow benefit is different. So, what a widow's benefit is, is if Chris passes away at whatever age he claims Social Security. If that is higher than Jasmine's Social Security, then she will get that. So here's, here's what I'm saying. So this is great because this is spousal and widow. So the spousal benefit is 1,667, which is half of Chris's full retirement age Social Security. The widow's benefit, and I'm showing him passing away at 90, she's going to get that at 71 which would be $4,135. And there's a cost of living adjustment on that. So whatever that is at age 90, right? So it's getting a 1.88% cost of living adjustment. I just did this for simplicity purposes. So she would get his age 70 social security, not his 67, his age 70. So spousal and widow benefits are totally different when it comes to claiming social security. That's why you really want to have a good strategy for claiming social security. That's how you can increase your retirement income is understanding when you're going to claim social security. Okay. I feel like I was in a beautiful mind that entire segment and I'm Russell Crowe riding on the board there because social security is like, Oh my gosh, it's like the, the, the scene in the hangover when all those 
you know, stats are going in front of that guy's face. It's just like, it's, it's, it's very confusing, but you want to understand it because you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay. So spousal and widow benefits are really important to understand. That's how you can increase your retirement income. Let's look at single benefits for a minute because I've got a lot of single clients and understanding when you're going to claim social security as a single person is very, very important. Darren, where is Darren at? Here's Darren. Okay, let me show you Darren. Okay, so this is Darren. And Darren's 60 years old. And he makes about $100,000. And his retirement age is going to be 62. So Darren, his Social Security at 67 is $3,000 a month. Okay, so he's got $3,000 coming a month as a single person at 67. He's going to retire at 62. So he's got two more years of making $100,000. We've got two more years of contributing to our 401k. Okay, so we're going to continue to contribute to our 401k. And so when we go to retirement, we see that he's out of money at 95. Now, Darren is the individual that I was talking about earlier that said he wants to take Social Security at 62. So let me let me show you. Let's put that in the plan and show you what it looks like to take income earlier, Social Security earlier. Now, remember, as a single person, I want to try to push this out as far as possible because Social Security is the only guaranteed income stream that you're going to get that's got a coal increase and that's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Okay. So social security is really, really important when it comes to a single person and making sure you're maximized. Fast Eddie says this, Drew, can you switch your agent and switch which one makes more social security and show how that would change their retirement? Fast Eddie, I can do that. I've got kind of a list that I'm following right now, but yeah, we can do that. And I can, I can do that. If I get some time at the end, I'll, I'll definitely do that. So, Here's Darren. He's taking Social Security at 67. We're going to run out of money at 95. So let's change that to 62. So you guys know if he takes Social Security at 62, he would only get 70% of his full retirement benefit. His full retirement benefit being $3,000 at 67. So $3,000, 70% of that is $2,100. So let's make the adjustment. $2,100. Go to 62. Let's save this. We're still working for another two years. Okay, we're making 100000 We're contributing our 401k. So now, look at that. He stays at 95. We still stay at 95 years old, taking Social Security at 62. Not a big difference for him, which is actually really nice. So we know now, if we have a situation where it's like this, where the client can take Social Security at 62, and the projection shows them running out of money at the same time it does for 67. Now we're looking at the projection saying, okay, we have some flexibility in our planning. Now we have flexibility in the sense of what if the market takes a dump at age 63 or 64 and our retirement assets go from $773,000 down to $600,000 or $550,000. And we're trying to delay our social security to 67. Would it make sense at that point to take Social Security early? So that's what we're looking at now if Social Security at 62 and 67 are pretty much even. We're trying to say, okay, what's the most flexible way to do it? It's kind of like having a, you know, you've got a water hose. We've got the water hose turned on for our retirement investments, paying out retirement income. Social Security gets added into that. If the asset or if the water hose is paying out all this income and we need to turn that off, right, to let that build back up, we can take Social Security a little earlier than planned. That's why within the financial EKG, we want to continue to review this every year and we want to be flexible in our planning. We don't want to ever be so stuck on something that we're not able to be flexible enough to make adjustments when necessary. OK, so let's go back. So 95 is when we're running out, taking it at at, at 62 Let's go back. And again, running out of money in 95 is really good. Single guy running out of money in 95. There's other things going on in here, like some cash flows, like travel. He's going to work part time, possibly. Um, so there's things going on that 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 are going to help increase his retirement and get him to 95. But Social Security is one of the biggest factors that he needs to consider. Now, remember, three thousand dollars 
was his benefit at 67. So now let's look at taking it at 70. So at 70, we take $3,000. At 70, you would get 124% of your full retirement benefit. So let's go to 3,000, put 1.24% in the calculator, and let's take this up 3720, move this up to 70. So now if Darren takes it at 70, all else being equal, still working for another two years, still contributing to his 401k, look at that, still at 95. He's still in a really good place. Now, what I've noticed that's changed you might not have seen is the amount needed today to avoid a shortfall has come down, meaning the influx of capital into this plan to make this money last forever has come down and his rate of return needed to avoid a shortfall. The amount of the stock market's rate of return on his investments in order to never run out of money has come down as well. So for him, we might be looking at this as saying, hey, listen, the year is 95, right? 2057, age 95, man, 2057. Can you imagine me in 2057? Age 95, that's when you're going to run out of money. But looking at some of the internal factors in the plan, your required rate of return has come down and your shortfall has come down in the sense of having to put more capital into the plan. So that's actually a situation we say, maybe we look at taking it at 70. Again, we're going to look at this based on market projections too, right? So our geometric return, earning just 6% in the market, has got him running out at 95 but if we take his investments back to 1968, when we had the, I would say 68 to 82 was the best decade, you know, 12, 14 years to look at for what inflation is going on right now. You know, we had a six and a half percent CPI reading this morning. So what inflation is going on right now, I would say kind of, kind of looks at late sixties and seventies. So we look at what the market's done and he's actually out of money at 83. Okay. If we go to 2000, which is like the lost decade, we're actually out at 75. So if we have like sequence of return risk, negative 10, negative 13, negative 23. So sequence of return risk is you go into retirement and the market goes down at the beginning of your retirement. So you have multiple years of a down market. So you're pulling out retirement income from an asset that is going down because of the market, because of outside factors. It's not because you're taking more income, you're spending more than you need. It's, it's because of something you can't control, right? You cannot control the market. Um, maybe somebody can, but you can't control the market. And so if we have sequence of return risk, we're looking at this. This is where we might say, okay, Darren, if this is a situation we're dealing with, then maybe we take Social Security at 62 or 64 or 65 or whatever right? We look at trying to take it a little earlier. And it, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not penalizing you for taking it early. It's not penalizing you for taking social security a different time than you had planned. It's just, it's just good planning. It, what we're looking at is like, if you're driving, you know, there's these things called maps. I don't know if you know what a map is anymore, because now we just use our GPS on our phones, but there's these things called maps. And I remember when we used to drive to Florida. I grew up in Kentucky and we drive to Florida. We go to Panama City or Destin, Florida or Gulf Shores, Alabama for spring break. And when we would drive from Elizabethtown, Kentucky to Gulf Shores, Alabama, my dad would have a map <clears throat> and he would look at the map and, and get an idea of where he's going. Well, the most optimal route sometimes gets blocked by a wreck or construction. So you got to like pull out the map and look for a more another route. And that's the same thing with the EKG. That's the same thing with your financial planning and your social security. When you're planning your retirement income, the most optimal route might get blocked. And so you got to make adjustments. And so that's what we do within the EKG. We're making adjustments. So if we're trying to increase our retirement income, sometimes increasing your retirement income is just making the best decisions for your retirement income. Let me show you this. This is from Social Security. And so if we take Social Security at 62, you get 70% of your benefit. If we take Social Security at 64, it's 80%. If you take Social Security at 65, it's 86.7 and it goes up there. So it's not necessarily bad if you're 65 years old and the market takes a, you know, lays an egg and you got to take Social Security at 65. You're going to get 86% of your full retirement benefit. Does that help your money last forever? Does that help your retirement plan? If it does, 
then don't kick yourself because you didn't get to take Social Security at 67 or 70 like everybody says. You're doing what's best for you. And that's really what I want to tell people. Retirement planning is individualized. Retirement planning is not something that it's, I call it Pillsbury Doughboy, where you're like, set it and forget it. It works for everybody. You know, like you could take a Pillsbury dough cookie, whatever, put it on your cookie sheet, put it in the oven in Florida at 375 degrees for 10 minutes, you're going to pull out cinnamon rolls. I could do the same thing in Kentucky. I can do the same thing in California. Maybe the altitude in, in Colorado would, would change that. But I could do that for the most part anywhere in the world. But your retirement plan is not like that. Your retirement plan, your retirement income is individualized to you, to where you live, to are you single, are you married, do you have kids? Your retirement plan it determines so many different factors that are in your little world. It's not about the big world, about what everybody's saying. It's your little world. I don't mean that as condescending your little world. My little world is right here. And so what affects my little world is different from what affects your little world. So our financial plan should be built on our world. And so that's what we try to do with the financial EKG is say, hey, listen, let's build a plan that fits you, not just some calculator that's online that you just plug and play and you look at it and it gives you like a robot response, even though, you know, AI is out there and chat GPT is pretty cool. But let's build a plan that is for you. And let's start factoring in all those little areas that we need to think about. And Social Security is one of those areas. Okay, so how can you increase your retirement income? Maximize your retirement accounts. Listen, if you guys have questions, put those in the comments section. We'll go through those. Maximize retirement accounts. Delaying Social Security payments. And the third way to increase your retirement income, and this is one that nobody really likes, and that is to continue working or to work part-time. And what do I mean by work continuing to work? Well, let's go back to Darren. Okay, let me show you Darren. Come on, go to Darren. Go to Darren. All right, add to stream. There we go. All right, had to get the software to work. So this is Darren. Now, Darren's original plan, okay, was he wanted to retire right now. And his original plan had no part-time work. So take out part-time work. Okay. So his original plan didn't have the part-time work and he was retiring early and he was going to take social security at 62. So let me get that figure again to give you what the original one looked like. So that's 2,100. And that's 62. Go back to cash flows here. What is the $200,000 inflow? Oh, okay. That's the sell down. Okay, perfect. All right. So when we looked at his original plan, he was actually out at 89 using the geometric returns. And then when we went to the market, what upset Darren was looking at market returns. And he was concerned that he thought, he thinks that the market's going to have some real flux volatility is not going to perform like it has over the last 10 years or 15 years or 20, which I agree with. I don't think the stock market's going to average what it has over the last 10 years. So he looked at it and said, Hey, I, I need to make an adjustment here. And so that's when I started talking to him. I said, well, Hey, do you, do you not, do you like your job? And he's like, well, yeah, I like my job. I, I don't have anything wrong with it. I said, well, then why do you want to retire at 60? And he's like, well, I just thought that was what you're supposed to do. And I said, well, I mean, you can, if you want, but, but why don't you work an extra couple of years? And so for Darren, we looked at working for an extra couple of years to age 62. Because what that's going to do is give him two more years of making 100000 two more years of a 401k contribution or an IRA contribution or a Roth IRA, whatever you're doing. It also allows us to push his Social Security up so we can push that up to 3000 And I also talked to him about, hey, what if you, what if you work part time? He, Darren's a single guy and he likes to work. And, and not in the sense of like, you know, like my grandfather's generation, right? The World War II generation, they were the kind that like the badge of honor was working 60 hours a week, right? Like they worked, they worked hard and they worked. And so that's that, that's a great work ethic that they instilled in us that, that we should probably have a little bit better work ethic than we do today. But Darren's that, he's kind of that old school nature where he wants to work. I said, well, what if he works part time? He said, well, I can do that. And so then we add in a little part-time work. So we say, okay, Darren, how about a little part-time work here? 
let's just make a thousand dollars a month working part time. And let's do this when you retire. And let's do this for how long do you want to do it? How about six years? So that's 62 to 68. And we go to retirement. And now he pushes it to 95. And so just for him, it's making these small adjustments that help the overall retirement plan. So really, why are we talking about increasing retirement income? Why is it so important to talk about increasing our retirement income? Because 99% of individuals today have not saved enough for retirement. It's the 1% that have saved enough for retirement. But 99% of people have not saved enough for retirement. And I'm passionate about this. And I, again, I'm not browbeating you, but I want to work with you and I want to help you get to retirement, get through retirement and protect your ability to stay in retirement. And if you look at all the stats, Fidelity, Vanguard, the Fed, all of them, we're not saving enough for retirement. The average Social Security benefit for 2022 is 1827. So $1,827 is the average Social Security benefit for the year 2022. Now, that's going to increase, obviously, for 2023. I think it already has increased by about 8%. And so the average household retirement income, the average retirement household income need is $71,000. The median is $46,000. I found this statistic, and I thought you would like this. This is from the United States Census Bureau. And what this is saying... The average retirement income broken down by age. So what people need broken down by age. We have median and mean. Okay, so the means, it just means a fancy word for average. But median is where we're going to hang out. That's where I like. So age 60 to 64, the median is 70,000. Okay, now again, this is a median for the entire country. So it's not this. So Florida, it's like $55,000 is the median retirement income. So if I'm doing planning for someone in Florida, 55,000 is the app. Like I can tell them, hey, 55,000 is, is normally what people need in Florida. It's different in New York. It's different in California. I'm working with some people in California right now. And that's that's in more in the 70s. OK, so it's different per state. Um, Tennessee, I've got clients there that we work with a lot less. OK, age 65 to 69, the median household income, 60,324 is what they need. 70, 74, 53, and 75 plus 37. Obviously, it goes down as we get older. And new studies show that, so the 80% replacement rule is what people used to use for getting retirement income, meaning they would replace income by 80%. And so, <laughs> sorry, that's my walk in my office. 80% would be the replacement ratio, but now we're seeing 60% is actually what is, is statistically there. And we're seeing a 1.8% decrease in the retirement income. So what we're seeing is we need to have a plan for our retirement income. And Social Security only makes up one third. Social Security only makes up one third of retirement income for individuals and families. So your assets, your investments, your real estate are going to make up two thirds of your retirement income. That's why it's so, so important to understand where it's going to come from. Okay. All right. Questions. That's all my notes. Questions. I have some bonuses down here that I want to talk about. We've gone 38 minutes. I've got about, I don't know, 10 more minutes. I'm starting to get hungry. So we're going to start moving into to some lunch. I, bonuses. Anybody have any questions when it comes to increasing retirement income? financial planning, retirement income, anything that you want to talk about, let's talk about it now. Hey, listen to, if you want a financial EKG, if you want to work with me in the description below is how to get in contact with me, or you can go to our website, yourfinancialekg.com or our business website, which is pearlwealthgroup.com. I think it's up here in the corner up there, pearlwealthgroup.com. All right. So bonus, let's talk about increasing retirement income. Let's talk about a bonus that we're, or let's bonus round when it comes to ret increasing retirement income. Rising interest rates are bringing an opportunity to increase your retirement income. Now you thought rising interest rates were a bad thing. You thought rising interest rates were going to hurt your retirement investments, 
But I believe that rising interest rates are actually going to help your retirement investments. And let me show you what I mean by that. Because what we're seeing now is something that I've been doing this 16 years. I have been a financial advisor for 16 years. Okay. I have never seen interest rates this high. I've never seen interest rates where they're at today. And so we've got to take advantage of where interest rates are at. Let me show you this chart. This is a really cool website. It's called Y Charts. You can get there anytime you want. This is Y Charts. This is the daily treasury yield curve for, for y, from Y Charts for today. So this is the treasury yield curve. Currently, okay, now this is as of January 11th. So it's not updated for today, January 12th, uh, because we had a CPI rating come out. Interest rates have ticked up and ticked down depending on the stick, the, the curve that you're looking at. But one month treasury rates right now, 4.42% interest. Two year treasury rates, 4.2, actually less than a one month. Six month treasury rates, 4.8%. Three month treasury rates, 4.72. You have the ability right now to get 4.8% on a six-month U.S. Treasury. That is an opportunity for you to make more interest and increase your retirement investing or your retirement income. So think about it this way. If you are a little skittish of the stock market and you've got some extra cash or you have money that's allocated within your IRA, your brokerage account, and, and you've brought that money to cash, or you've taken it to very, very conservative investments because you're just kind of concerned about the overall market. What, what you can actually do is reallocate some funds to these treasury bonds short term, get some interest. Now, I'm not talking about buying ETFs or buying mutual funds because those can still fluctuate with the buying and the selling supply and demand of those funds. I'm talking about buying the physical U.S. treasuries. We're doing this a lot for clients. You know, I have a client call me and say, hey, Drew, I've got like 50000 in the bank. I know I need to do something with it. I need to earn some interest. I just don't feel comfortable right now going into, you know, in, in investing that. And I'll say, well, what about some treasuries? Why don't we put this in to like a three-month treasury, you know, January to April. We get 4.7% for those three months. And then we reassess at that three-month period. And if they're in another state, not Florida, not Texas, not a state that doesn't have a state income tax, I have clients that live all over the country. And if they live in New York, California, tax Massachusetts, I was about to say tax Massachusetts, but Max Massachusetts, if you live in a state with a high state or local income tax, you can actually invest in U.S. treasuries and the interest is tax free on the state and local level. So this gives you a way to invest some of that extra capital into something, if, especially if it's not IRA money, and you can get some added interest on it and not pay extra taxes on that money. OK, that's a great opportunity. That is a great opportunity. There's also opportunities in corporate bonds, in municipal bonds, and there's also opportunities in some of the ETFs, in some of the mutual funds out there if you're willing to hold them for a long time frame. So for instance, let me just pull up a easy website. Let me see if I can find. I want to show you what interest is at right now. Uh, let's see, ETFs. Let me go to Vanguard's website. Now again, I'm not I'm not saying that Vanguard's the greatest. I'm not saying that I only use Vanguard. I just want to show you this because their website's really nice in the sense of organizing funds. So look at this. This is Vanguard.com. And the reason I like this is because they really organize their, you know, the funds that they offer really well. And so if you look at some of the yields, now these are 30 day yields. So these aren't like the 12 month yields that you might see on a prospectus or see in a portfolio. These are 30 day yields. VCIT, the Intermediate Term Corporate Bond. Okay, this is a fund that we own for clients in our portfolios. The 30-day yield on it is 5.18%. Like, when has that happened? Okay, 
Now, I'm not saying that you want to invest in that completely unless you're going to be a more mid to longer term investor, you know, three, four, five years, because there will be fluctuations in the fund itself. Remember, as interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down. OK, if you own the physical bond and you have a maturity date, you're not as necessarily worried about that. But if you're owning a mutual fund or ETF, there is a thing called duration risk, which is the risk in the fluctuation of your fund based on the rise of interest rates. So if interest rates move up too fast, too quickly, your fund might go down rather quickly. I don't think we're going to see interest rates increase another 4%, maybe a quarter, maybe 1%, which is not going to have too much duration exposure. We might even see interest rates go down over the short term, meaning the next two, three years, tick down a little bit. And that would actually be a benefit if you're buying bond ETFs or bond mutual funds at this level. So look at that. I mean, ESG US corporate bond, 5% interest. And let me say, let me preface this too. You don't want to have all your money in one single fund. You want really good diversification. The reason I'm showing you this is I want you to see the opportunities that are out there for you as an investor, whether that's in treasury bonds, whether that's in corporate bonds, whether that's in municipal bonds, whether that's in actual funds. And these are just Vanguard funds. Again, I'm not saying that Vanguard's the, you know, they're the only way, right? No, I, I think Fidelity and Schwab, I'm just, I like their website and how it's easily organized. And that's why I'm showing that to you. Short-term corporate bonds. So this is one that we own for clients as well. I like short-term because it's not as exposed to interest rate risk. The 30-day uh, yields, almost 5%, 4.99%. Now the one-year performance is only 5.6, is negative 5.61. And 10 years, only 1.56. Again, we're not holding this forever. We're just trying to take some opportunities to get some better interest to increase our retirement income or to increase our retirement investments. So rising interest rates bring a great opportunity for you to increase your retirement income. OK, so I hope that makes sense because I, I this is I love doing this. And so I hope that I've, I've been able to explain this easily for you especially the social security part. If you if you didn't see the social security explanation from the beginning of this video, go back and check that out because that is really, claiming social security is probably to me from one, is probably one of the biggest decisions, maybe the biggest decision you'll make in retirement. Because when you claim social security, you, you don't really get a do-over. Now you get a do-over, like social security has a do-over, you have to say, if you claim Social Security at 62 and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. I made a mistake. I don't want to do it. You basically have to pay back all the payments that you've gotten. Uh, it's, a, it's a 12. You have to do it within 12 months and you got to pay back everything you got. So I, I've never in 16 years had a client do a do over. OK, never. Um, so that's why it's really important to make the decision, to make the right decision. So Jake from Virginia, not Jake from State Farm, but Jake from Virginia says cash value from life insurance. Is it a good or bad source of retirement income? Jake from State Farm, Jake from Virginia, that's a great question. Cash value life insurance, is it a good source of retirement income? A lot of times, Jake, people will have, and maybe you do, you'll have some life insurance that you've had for a long time, whole life insurance, and it's got a big cash value in it. And so you might be looking at that cash value saying, goodness, this thing has grown for the last 20 or 30 years. Should I use this for retirement income? And I actually have a client right now. He lives in Sarasota and we're working with, he has a, um, I think it's Prudential. He has a Prudential life insurance policy from way back in the day. Um, he is 75 years old. So he's had this life insurance policy for a long time. And inside of his life insurance policy, he has about $200,000 of cash value, okay? He's got $200,000 in cash value in his life insurance policy. Now, some of that's tax-free and some of it's taxable, okay? But he's got $200,000 in his cash value in his life insurance, okay? Old policy. Now, at TD Ameritrade, the investments that we manage, okay, he has about $350,000 between IRAs, regular accounts, and a Roth IRA, okay? This figure was about four twenty-five dollars pre-last year. Now, this gentleman's taking retirement income from his $350,000. 
there's a medical need in his situation. He's a chronic medical condition. Not, it's not killing him, but it's chronic. So he has to take a lot more retirement income to pay for some of the health needs that he has that aren't covered by Medicare. Because listen, not everything's covered by Medicare. We've talked about that on this channel. Not all of your health insurance needs in retirement are covered by Medicare. Okay, long-term care, not covered by Medicare. Assisted living, not covered by Medicare. And that's what he's dealing with. He's dealing with a situation where he has a chronic issue. It's not killing him. And so he's going to have to pay out for care every year. So here's what we did. His account came down from 425 to 350 because of distributions and because of market loss. And so what we did, Jake from State Farm, Jake from Virginia, is we started using his cash value from his life insurance for income, kind of as in the interim. Now, we've done this for about six months now. We've taken income out of his cash value because what we're trying to do is let his investments recuperate. Now, he has to take a required minimum distribution out of his IRA that's a portion of this. So we have to take out that income. But we're tapping this life insurance that he never thought he would need. He's a single guy. Um, his kids are his beneficiaries of the life insurance. His kids are doing great. They've got great jobs. They don't necessarily need the money. Obviously, it'd be a benefit. You know, bene if he passed away, he wants them to have the money. It would be a blessing to them. But he needs to live himself. Like he needs to live from now until retirement. So we are actually using the cash value from the life insurance for income. Now, if you're planning today. You know, we work with a lot of clients who see things. There's a book called The Power of Zero out there. Um, a lot of people are talking about it's, people love it. People hate it. They use life insurance for retirement planning. What I always tell people is this, whether you're using stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, life insurance, annuities, real estate, master limited partnerships, uh, UITs, whatever, whatever it is, it's all a tool in the tool bag. And it's got to fit your house. When you're building your retirement house, okay, boop, boop, boop. the tools that you build have to fit what you're trying to do, right? So when you build a house in Florida, it's different than when you build a house in Kentucky, okay? In Kentucky, when we build a house, you build a, a basement, right? You build a foundation that has a basement. In Tampa, if we build a basement, you hit water. So... You've got to build a house that's fit for your individual situation. Jake, great question. Cash value life insurance, is it a good or bad source of retirement income? I think it's a great source that can be used in your overall planning. Okay, so let's look at this. How can we increase our retirement income? We went through maximizing retirement accounts. We went through delaying Social Security or talking about when to take Social Security the best time for spousal benefits, widow benefits, single benefits, married benefits. We talked about working longer, maybe having some part-time, making some adjustments as necessary. We've talked about bonusing, rising interest rates. That brings a great opportunity for increasing your retirement income. That's a great way to do that. You're seeing, a re you're seeing increases in all, every area of, of retirement right now. You're seeing increases in not only bonds, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, interest rates, that you, the interest that you can get there. You know, we, I just showed you that with Vanguard, but you're seeing interest go up on things like annuities, like the payouts. Again, I'm, I'm again, we're, everything that we use is a tool in the toolbox. So like annuities have interest rates that are coming up, which means we can pay out more from annuities for lifetime income, which is great. Again, if you're going to use an annuity, don't use something that's in the market that has fees. You want something very just vanilla, it's paying you income and you don't want to have all your money in it. You just want to use it as a, as a tool. So we're seeing increases in that. We're seeing increases in life insurance and things like that. For people, when we're doing estate planning, we're able to get better rates for estate planning because of interest rates going up. So it's actually not necessarily a bad thing that interest rates are going up. We needed interest rates to normalize a little bit. The Fed probably should have been raising rates. Now, we started raising rates in 2018. And then COVID hit in 2020, and we brought interest rates back down to zero to help the economy. Obviously, we can look back and play armchair quarterback and say that was probably a bad decision. We should have just left interest rates alone, right? There's a lot of things maybe in 2020 we could have looked at and said we could have done something better. But we, we got to look forward, right? I mean, we were it was basically like a wartime atmosphere. You got to kind of look forward and say, okay, what can we do better now? So interest rates going up are actually going to benefit you 
in the retirement space. Okay. So it's been 54 minutes and 40 seconds. I'm going to call it quits if there's not any other questions. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. God bless. Bye-bye.